Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Join us as we seek the truth and travel the long road to justice. Hi, everybody. It's Tuesday. Time for another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. What's good, Fruit Loop? Humidity. Oh, my gosh. It's so hot here. Yeah, I'm I'm done with it. Like, yeah. I take a shower, dry my hair, and it's like, poof. I know. Yeah. Yep. It is getting to be that time of year here in the South. So we want to give a huge, huge thank you to Denise, one of our awesome listeners. She, uh, I went and checked our P.O. box yesterday, and we had a package. And so there were these really awesome, nice Kansas City Chiefs cups that like keep your drinks hot and cold. Yeah, it was cool. So I've been using it all day for my coffee. And so uh, she also said she has some barbecue sauce coming from Kansas City. So sweet, Denise, you rock. You're the best. I love barbecue sauce. Thank you for thinking of us. That's very nice. That's awesome. So we now have a full merchandise store. That's crazy. Yeah. Um. If you guys want a t-shirt, there's all kinds of stuff there. Go to prettyliesandalibis.com. It'll take you right to our store. I have made so many variations of these shirts because I try to think, well, what if this person doesn't want the big logo, but maybe something in the top right corner? So there's a lot of different options. If you don't see an option that you want with all of our logos, um, shoot us a message because I'm able to hop on there and really just create whatever using the logos um any way I want so if if there's a combination of logos you want or you want them placed a certain way just reach out and we'll we'll do that yeah cool there's a lot of stuff on there it's pretty neat it is neat um I've got a couple of shirts coming and we we've had a lot of people buy already I was blown away I could not believe how many sales we've already gotten yeah, it's pretty neat. It's very it's cool. It's crazy to think somebody's walking around with your logo on. It is very weird. We're still getting used to that. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, just check it out if there's something you like. We don't set the prices on these, by the way. Teespring does. I've tried to look for a little bit more of a cost-effective option, but I've had no luck. Yeah. It seems to be that they're kind of the more popular one because the quality is very good. So for me, I would always rather pay a couple of dollars more to get something that's going to last when I wash it and dry it and all that oh, good yeah. stuff. So yeah. Anyways, we have a big case here out of the low country in South Carolina. And uh, I remember hearing about this boating accident a few years ago. Um, yep. Didn't follow it closely, but now we've got a big, big thing because the son who was charged with three felony counts of boating under the influence that resulted in the death of this girl named Mallory Beach, who was riding on this boat, he was found murdered last week with his mother. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. So what we're going to do on this episode, we're going to put out another a Sweet Tea episode pretty soon after we do this one today, just because there was so much with this case, it, it would have went an hour. So we're going to start here. Um, so what about the Murdaugh family? So they are a very prominent South Carolina family. Um, their family has been county elected prosecutors uh, almost back almost 90 years. Um, they prosecuted blah, 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 prosec- prosecuted most every criminal case in the low country. Um, one resident who didn't want to be named said the family is the law around there. Yeah. So, That's scary. Yeah. The dad, Alex, who is the father and the husband of the two victims. Um, He is like his father, his father's father. This goes way back. Um, So. It reminds me of some show on, you know, like you see uh, Walker, Texas Ranger or something. Right. I just told my age a little bit saying that, but yeah, yeah, like these, they go in and these families have run the town forever. Yeah. And that really seems to be the case here. So we're going to start just with the murders and then we're going to get into the backstory of the boating accident that happened in 2019 in a bit. I have found the most information on this case through the island packet i believe it's called it is a local little uh, publication down near the coast that to me is it has had a lot of information fitz news here in greenville has also had or here in south carolina has also had a lot of information about the cases the problem i get into is their paywalls so these articles i just chose which one to pay for but uh, so the island packet is what i've been using to do most of our research and then just going back on social media so Paul, who was was 22, 
he is the one that is accused of being the the driver on the boat the night the girl was thrown from it and killed his him and his mother uh, maggie who was 52 they were both found murdered on june 2nd at their hunting lodge in Islington, island ton south carolina and their bodies were found near the dog kennels they said the bodies were not found together and the estimated times of death were between 9 and 9 30 p.m this is a really really small area uh, town that i think there's maybe 70 residents yeah yeah i looked it up it was little yes yep. very small um so they had 1.7 acres oh no it's like 1700 acres oh I thought that was a point. It is a point. Oh, my okay. bad. All right. So <laughs> 1,700 acres with two homes on the property. Um, there's a lot of undeveloped land down in that area. There is. And yeah. and just to put this out there, the low country of South Carolina, these places, Beaufort, Bluffton, Charleston, they're all really expensive places to live. Um, I mean, Charleston's a, a college town and you have a lot of college students because you have the College of Charleston and the Citadel right there. But for the most part, people that live down in these areas are well-to-do. Yeah, well, Beaufort is a closed island. Like, yeah. you've got to have reason to be there. You can't just go over there and visit. Well, Beaufort's where they filmed some of Forrest Gump with the shrimp and boat scenes. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> that's my boat. <laughs> <laughs> that The picture of Tom Hanks standing waving on the dog just hit my mind when you said that. Oh, yeah, it's classic. Yeah. Uh, so the bodies were found by Alex, which is Maggie's husband and Paul's dad. They haven't released, um, authorities haven't released that information, but I I believe a source did, that he was the one that that found the bodies. And according to this source, he says he was out shooting, I guess, on the residence at the time of the murders. And so the call about the discovery of the bodies came in at 1026 p.m. Uh, So he was out shooting at night? Well, I mean, I was thinking about that. You know, here... This time of year, though, I was noticing last night, 945, there was still a little bit of daylight. Yeah, most hunting, though, you can't do at night. Like, yeah, well, let's just say that there's been some some things said, and we're going to get into it uh, here kind of towards the end Yeah, about Dad. Yeah, gotcha. So the next day on June 8th, authorities say the public isn't in danger. This made my ears go up because you have a double homicide of a very, very well-to-do, prominent family, and the next day you say the public isn't in danger. So that tells me they've got a really good grasp on who maybe has done this. Oh, yeah. In fact, just now, right before we went on, they released that authorities believe there were two suspects. There were two different guns used. Oh, wow. There was a shotgun and then an assault rifle. So, So, yeah. Um, the Colleton County Sheriff's Office res- recused, recused. See, I was going to say rescued. Um, recused themselves from the case due to a conflict of interest and handed the investigation over to SLED. That tells you right there that family's huge in that area. Well, yeah, they are. I yeah. mean, and, and there were so many questions about this this boating accident and things that happened in the early course of the investigation that that shows that family has a lot of pull. But uh, so Paul, as far as the wounds, Paul was shot in the head and the upper body with a shotgun and his mother Maggie was shot with an assault rifle. So authorities right now sort of are feeling that Maggie was kind of collateral damage and might have just been killed because she was there. They feel wow. like Paul was the intended target. Wow. Um so Paul was awaiting a criminal trial for the death of Mallory Beach. Uh she was 19. Uh, she was killed on February 19th, 2019. Uh, her body was not found until March 3rd, miles away in the marsh area of the river. And she was found by boaters. Yeah. So we're going to get into that whole thing after we talk about these murders. But um, the same month that her body was found, her mother filed a wrongful death suit. Um, interestingly enough, Paul, who is the, the driver of the boat, uh, he's not named in that suit. And it came out that the reason she didn't include Paul in that suit, according to her attorney, is because she didn't think he had any money, any assets, or anything to sue for. Wow. Um, yeah. But they've been very quick since the murders to, I guess, sort of exonerate themselves in the eyes of the media. They've submitted to DNA testing, and they, they release a really heartfelt statement after the family, um, after Paul and Maggie were, were found murdered where they just say they understand the grief and 
uh, they pray for justice, that sort of thing. So I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not feeling that this has anything to do with with uh, with with Mallory's death. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's just a gut feeling I have. Apparently, everybody who was on the boat that night, there were six. They've all submitted to testing, just probably to go ahead and and just get that that speculation over with. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so the charges against Paul will be dismissed now that he is dead, but the investigation will be ongoing. I found that interesting. Um, yeah, I guess they're still trying to rule out, make sure somebody else wasn't driving, I guess. Yeah. I mean, at the time there were two different possible people that were driving that boat. I almost wonder though, if the investigation is ongoing, maybe due to how some of the things went, like I said, in the early days of this investigation, there were some things that, uh, you could already tell they had had some favors done at the time of this boating accident. So yeah, this is why boating and alcohol doesn't mix. Yeah. I mean, clearly it's like, you can't blow anything. If you're on the water, like, you know, if you're driving, you can blow a certain in the breathalyzer thing and you're still, you're not deemed drunk. Uh, drunk. Yeah, right. But on a boat, zero. Yeah. Well, like there's no <laughs> tolerance for alcohol on a boat. Yeah. And they all were grossly intoxicated is the phrase they use. So on, um, June the 9th, just a few days after these murders, the, the grandpa died. Ra- Randolph Murdaugh, he was 81, and um, so he's the, the grandfather of Paul and Maggie, the, the vi- other victim in this case, that's his daughter-in-law. And uh, it just seems to be by chance, authorities have put out there this was natural causes. Um, so you think uh, he has a brother, Paul has a brother named Buster, that's his nickname, and uh, so I've seen some pictures of him at both the services. And so it has to be really, I mean, just a crazy time for that family. Yeah. Um, so the family of Mallory Beach issued a statement saying um, that to the uh, News 11 down there, whatever, in Savannah, that having suffered the devastating loss of their own daughter, the family prays that the Murdals can find some level of peace from this tragic loss. Uh, they would like the family and the community to know that their thoughts and continued prayers are with the Murdals. Yeah. That's that's awesome. Yeah. So uh, authorities are being really, really tight-lipped on these murders. They have given up nothing except to say this was not a murder-suicide. Um, so they feel certain it was a double homicide. Um, they did find shell casings at the scene, um, th- but they won't say if it looks like the bodies were moved they won't answer if there's any surveillance on the property. They won't say if they have any suspects. They won't answer why they said there's no threat to the community so quickly after the murders. And so a lot of people in that low country are starting to wonder what's going on. Yeah, I guarantee you there's either trail cams or something. You know uh, a family this wealthy and that notorious because you have to consider these are prosecutors. They are responsible for sending, there's no telling how many people in 100 years to prison and yeah. also to death row. Yep. They're they're not popular with everybody. Um, so I think it's just going to be crazy. Uh, we, we've heard about a suspect, but... Um, they, they had a friend of the family interviewed on Fox News who said uh, when they were asked if if the dad knew who do this, who did this, the only thing he said to this person was he was confident that justice would be served and really didn't elaborate. So obviously somebody said, hey, I mean, do you have any idea? And that was the only thing he said. Yeah. So they won't say if the suspect, if they suspect the murders were in relation to Mallory's death, though, right? They won't say. They're not saying anything yeah. uh, at all. And um, Where are we seeing this? It's like, it's probably <laughs> Rob Wood's cousin or something. Yeah, right. All right. Yeah. Just keep everything close. Yeah. Um, but they released a, a SLED, which is the State Law Enforcement Division, released a statement today at 1127 a.m. And it says that today marks the eighth day in the double homicide case where no arrests have been made and no suspect has been publicly named. I have no additional information to release at this time as our investigation is ongoing. And that was from SLED spokesperson Tommy Crosby. Sheesh. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I understand why there's nothing being said. They want to keep it. Yeah. I get tight. it. I understand that. Well, I will say now that we've got through that part, um, Fitz News in Green, or I keep saying in Greenville. I don't think they're in Greenville, but I think they're in Charleston, right? Yeah. They're, so it's just a, a, a statewide 
publication where they kind of keep up on the all these news stories. They have been told kind of in confidence that authorities may be looking at the dad, Alex. Wow. I don't know. I mean, if you put things together, like you say, it's he finds the bodies at like 1030 at night. He's been out hunting. Um, like really the only hunting you do at night is uh, raccoons. Right. That's it. Yeah, I don't and know. you have dogs and all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, they haven't specified anything about where he was, but so somebody told Fitz News that they are looking very closely at digital stuff related to the father, um, but we don't know that for a fact. I mean, you think about it, there, there's so many possibilities. So oh, many yeah. possibilities of... of, of and, and, and honestly... We're going to talk a little bit about Paul, especially when he's been drunk here in just a bit. But somebody had told Fitz News, uh, a source had said that Paul was described as an entitled sociopath with a short fuse. And I think we all kind of know these rich kids. And I'm not trying to dirty the victim up, but it seems like this kid maybe wasn't the easiest person to get along with. Yeah. And I'm sure if your family has that much status... Um, you probably walk with a little bit of a strut. Who knows? Well, yeah, I think we're going to talk about it in a minute, but didn't he have an alter ego or something? Yeah, I mean, he he's was one of, under the influence. He's one of those drunks. I'll just say one of those drunks. That yeah. When they get drunk, you just don't want to be around them because they, they're crazy. Yeah. So let's look into this boating accident that happened back in 2019. Okay, so about Paul, he was 19 at the time of the boating accident. Um, he was seen buying alcohol on surveillance using his brother's ID. Um, he was attending the University of South Carolina for criminology, uh, and Mallory attended there as well. Yeah. So according to friends, he had a drunk alter ego they called Timmy. And so in a deposition for the civil case, Anthony Cook is, um, Mallory, the girl who passed away. It's her boyfriend and Paul's cousin, has said that it's a different name because he turns into a completely, totally different person. So somebody will say, all right, here comes Timmy. We've got to go. He also said when Paul would get drunk, his eyes would get as wide as silver dollars and he wouldn't blink. And he would spread his fingers out and kind of move his arms in a crazy way. And they just said that he's a mean drunk and he liked to tear things up when he was drunk. He need to stay away from the alcohol. Oh, well. He done turned in uh, to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we've all been around one of those drunks before that they may be great when they're sober, but when they're drunk, it's just you don't want to be around them. I have. Um, I try not to hang out with drunks. <laughs> it's just no fun <laughs> I was going to say, me. I haven't. Yeah. I, I don't, I back don't in the I day, have. I guess yeah. I would say, back when I was young and wild. So yeah. this boating accident, there were six friends. All of them were underage. They were aged, I think, 18 to 20. They left from a boat dock, which was owned by the Murdoch family, and the boat was a 17-foot sea hunt boat. And so they were going to an oyster roast over on Pucky Island. That was about 18 miles away. Now, in the low country of South Carolina, oyster roasts are huge. Oh, yeah. Uh, it is just as much a status thing and uh, just an excuse to get together and drink and <laughs> eat oysters. It's a big deal in the South. Yeah, it's, uh, almost, it's like a low country boil. It really well, low country boil is the bomb. Oh yeah, um, that's like yeah, your dad does it. Oh, it's so really good. really good. It's potatoes and sausage and mussels shrimp. and shrimp and uh, corn and it's it's yeah. boiled and it has all these seasoning on it. It's really good. I've said my dad should open a food truck and do low yeah. country boil. Yeah, he could do it. It was good. Yeah. So the reason that they decided that night to take the boat over to Pucky Island for the oyster roast is because they had heard there were DUI checkpoints kind of along that route to get to that island. And so they wanted to avoid that, which that goes to show you they intended, whether by car or boat, to be driving intoxicated. Yeah. But but my thing is, if you get caught... Um, you probably don't have nothing happen because your your family runs the prosecutor's office. I mean, yeah, that's, that's the true. thing. <laughs> this is, and I'm not saying this is this has happened, but it sounds like somebody hadn't been held accountable their whole life. Well, and the other thing too, and this is going to be for another episode because there's just so much. But this family was suspected to have been involved in a murder a few years ago of a young man. Oh wow! And covered up. So we're we're going to look into that, but I. Not for this episode, because that's just going to be a whole one in itself. Yeah. 
So what did they say about everybody on the boat? So a report said that all of the people injured were grossly intoxicated. Um, According to Anthony Cook, Mallory's boyfriend, Paul had taken off all clothing except his underwear on the night of the accident. Um, It was around 40 degrees outside. Uh, He also said that arguments broke out between the six passengers. Okay, dude, (laughs) if it's 40 degrees outside and you're on a boat... At, towards the ocean it's cold it's yeah you got the sea breeze but i'm gonna tell you that's yeah. like a that's like a menopause dream right there yeah that, <laughs> that's that's gold well the cousin anthony cook said that he was known to strip down to his boxers for some reason when he was drunk i, I, mean, I guess that's one of those things um yeah <laughs> okay on, he needs some help yeah so the argument was that most of the passengers on the boat were ready to go home. This was well after midnight. It was dark. It was foggy. It was misty. Just terrible conditions to be boating, much less combining that with being grossly intoxicated. But um, one girl said, I have to go to work in the morning. I need to go home. And uh, so there's another guy on the boat named Connor Cook. And so Paul and Connor wanted to go into downtown Beaufort and do some shots before they went back, which is just a terrible idea. Um, yeah, it sounded like they were, they should have just went home. Yeah. So um, they went to this bar in downtown Beaufort. And uh, at one point, Paul was throwing chairs at somebody in the bar trying to start a fight. This was about an hour and a half before the crash. They did some shots there at the bar and got back on the boat. So. Okay. The, this crash sounds horrendous. It, it is bad. Um, it is bad. So it says the boat, which was speeding, crashed into a piling by a bridge near Paris Island. Um, all six passengers were ejected. Uh, Mallory was missing. Um, her autopsy showed cause of death as secondary blunt force trauma and drowning. Yeah, so Connor Cook, who is Anthony Cook's cousin, he looked for Mallory for about 20 minutes before calling 911. There were some issues with the 911 call because when he did call, this dispatcher sounded very confused. Um, So she sent first responders to the wrong location at first. Oh, no. The first ambulance didn't show up for 28 minutes. So if you think... He's looking for Mallory for 20 minutes before calling 911. And then the first ambulance doesn't show up until 28 minutes after. That's almost an hour where they're on the the, the shore or whatever. And then Mallory's lost. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, so fire and EMS were not even dispatched until 12 to 13 minutes into the 911 call. And she didn't ask if anybody was hurt until about three minutes and 40 seconds into the call. Statistically, it takes about 60 seconds from the time 911 is called and you are connected for them to kind of just get a quick picture of what's up and dispatch somebody. Eventually, this dispatcher resigned. It, it, I don't know that it would have made a difference with Mallory. It seems like she probably, with blunt force trauma, was killed very quickly. Yeah. But um, you know, never know. Yeah. I know our 911 here because I had to call it one night when my dad fell at home. I'm not laughing at he fell, but he stepped on a remote and fell on the floor. <laughs> he was okay. He just pulled some muscles, ligaments. But <laughs> when you call, they do send you to somebody else. Like when you make the initial call, they'll say, oh, well, I need to send you to this person. What, they'll say police, fire, or medical. Yeah. 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 Um, so it is a little bit weird, but that's a long time. Yeah. And on the 911 call, you can hear uh, a girl yelling for Mallory. You can hear that they're trying to, to see if she can hear them. And so when EMS got there, Anthony was pacing and yelling for his girlfriend, Mallory. And they said he was worried and seemed to be in shock a little bit. And he said there at the scene of the accident that Paul was drunk and they had asked Paul to let them drive, but he wouldn't let him. Wow. So, you know, you already have really incriminating stuff. And when you see how this goes later, you'll say, this is what happens when your family's prosecuted pretty much every case in the low country for almost 100 years. Yeah. Yep. So what about Paul when he got into the ambulance? Uh, So Paul was said to be uncooperative and abusive to the EMS personnel. Right. And that just shows that he was totally wasted. Right. Um, So initially they couldn't figure out who was actually driving the boat. Uh, They narrowed it down to Paul or Connor Cook. But I mean, at the scene, Anthony said Paul was drunk and driving and he wouldn't let us drive. Yeah. 
So between the time they were transported to the ER, two people had retained attorneys and they arrived to the ER shortly after officers. Right. And this is what blows my mind. The Department of Natural Resources, they did not do a field sobriety test at the scene. And they said their reasoning is at the time they couldn't determine who was driving. Um, but that it could it could uh, sway the case if they did a sobriety test on everybody there. And here's my my question. They're all under age. Somebody out of that group was driving that boat. Why would you not do field sobriety tests on a bunch of underage kids where you have somebody missing? Yeah, that's that crazy. sounds so stupid to me. Yeah, they did take Paul's blood at the hospital, but I've never heard of any kind of a level of what where he was at. Yeah, that's that's weird. That'd be like not doing it here. I mean, you know what I mean? Like you getting in a wreck and, oh, I'm not going to give anybody a breathalyzer. Right. But even after Anthony had said Paul was driving, the Beaufort County deputy put in his report that it was unclear which one of those was driving, Paul or Connor. And at that point, they passed the investigation on to the DNR. Uh, Yeah. So before DNR officers arrived on scene, Paul's father and grandfather arrive and tell officers they're lawyers and they stop all sobriety tests. I mean, I, mean, I guess maybe in it, how can you tell an officer to stop what they're doing? Yeah. You fight it in court. If that sobriety test comes back that he was drunk, then you question the method you did the sobriety test. Yeah. Well, here's the deal, though. They can't force you to do a sobriety test there. No, they can't. It's If they ask you and you decline, then... It's worse for you, actually, because yeah. somebody who's a defense attorney will tell you, I can probably beat the reading, but I can't make excuses for why you wouldn't do it in the first place. Yeah. You hear all the time of people getting off DUI results because they... Uh, question the breathalyzer or yeah. how they administered the the I guess the field sobriety test where you have to I mean I would be screwed if I had to say my ABCs backwards and I could be totally sober <laughs> there's no way I'm gonna tell you something when you're having to walk that line I'd be like oh, my bad hip and my what? knee I would I mean I would just be totally uh t- totally into pokey <laughs> oh yeah yeah you seen that one where it's got the guy, he's standing, he's doing all these, uh, you want me to do this dance? Oh, he does like that. Yeah, it's like hilarious. he's on the runway or yeah. he's doing model poses. Yeah, yeah, I think that funny. was a, that was not true. I yeah, think, I think that, it was staged, but it, it was still was funny. It was still funny. It was. Yeah. It was. So we did say that the sheriff's office recused itself from the accident investigation uh, because of their relationship with the Murdoch family. Um, we said that, I think, earlier, but that's a good point to make. Yeah, um, and so the Island Packet, which is the media company I've been using to research this, they got documents through the Freedom of Information Act, and it showed that deputies had narrowed it down to two people who were driving. But you think about it, if they had acted on that right in the middle of this investigation, um, it could have changed the investigation sure. really quickly. Sure. Um so the boat was actually registered to Alex Murdaugh, who's Paul's father. Yeah. I mean, that's that's not uncommon, I guess. No. I mean, yeah, it's the low country. These these people have boats. And a lot of times these kids are raised driving these little boats in the ocean. I mean, yeah. you know, that's just how you're brought up. But so Alex is a part-time prosecutor with the solicitor's office. And he's kind of the successor to their legal family, their dynasty. But interestingly enough, his law firm represents injured people in wrongful death suits, which he is now Im- embattled in because of his son's actions. Yeah. And um, so how long did it take for Paul to even be charged? So it took seven weeks after Mallory's death for Paul to be charged. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, yeah. He was charged with boating under the influence causing death and two counts of boating under the influence causing great bodily injury. Yeah, so he pled not guilty, and this is where you see that rich people justice coming into play. He was he pled not guilty. He was released on a fifty thousand dollar recognizance bond by Judge Michael Nettles. There was no GPS monitoring. There was no alcohol monitoring, even though he was drunk and still underage at the time. At the bond hearing, they he was returning to college. Now, here's my thing. Pretty much anybody I know that's been arrested for a DUI, whether it be on a boat or in a car, they have to wear an ankle monitor to monitor for for alcohol use and then an interlock device on your car, which you have to blow into every time you get in your car to make sure that you're not drunk. 
Yeah, and, and I think that is after so many. You have to have so many DUIs in a short, like short span of time. With the I know someone um, that has that, and it was they had to. It was it was a tight window that you had to get like three. In our state, it is anyways. Yeah, um, other states. I mean, your first your first DUI, you get interlock. Yeah, ours isn't. Our, some of our laws are like way behind. But this is what's so crazy. They did not prevent him from driving a car or a boat, even though it's customary. Anytime you've got an under the influence charge with death, you don't get to drive. Just just for comparison, I think maybe a week after this happened in the Low Country, there was a case where. Uh, a girl was driving a car. Her friend, uh, the girl was drunk. Her friend was killed in an accident and she was arrested. She was booked. She had to pay bail, which he did not. Recognizance bond means you just promised to show up to all your hearings. Um, and then she had an interlock device and ankle monitoring for um, her location as well as to make sure she's not drinking. So it goes to show you the difference in penalties for what is essentially like a like a DUI with death result. Oh yeah. So two different yeah. things going on. Yep. Um so that same month Mallory was found um her mother filed a wrongful death suit. Uh but and we talked about this a minute ago. Paul's not named. No. Um I would think they normally name like that per you know what I mean? Yeah. Like they would name I understand naming other people as well, but I mean, he's the one responsible. Right. Um, so the people named, there were other people named in the civil suit, but eventually some names were dropped off. They are naming Alex the father, Buster the brother. Um, and then I believe the gas station chain, I think it's called Parker's. It's low country. It's uh, kind of down towards Charleston, Savannah. It's it's not here in the upstate, uh, but it's a big um, convenience store chain in the low country. They didn't sue uh, the person that actually sold the alcohol because they don't have money. So you sue the chain. And that makes sense. I mean, yeah. if that were my daughter, I, I, I don't know. I mean, money's not going to bring them back, but I guess it's what you do. This, this family um, has made their, their living suing people for wrongful death. And so it, the tables have turned. Oh, yeah. But you want to make somebody pay for what they did. Definitely. Um, um, so mediation so far hasn't been successful in this case. It looks like it'll go to trial uh, because the wrongful death suit can still go on even though Paul's dead. He wasn't even named in it. So, yeah. So on April 18th, 2019, Paul was indicted on three felony charges. Mm hmm. Um, on May 6th, 2019, Paul pleads not guilty. He is never put in custody. Never. He had his booking photo made in his street clothes, and he was never, from what I understand, he was never handcuffed, put in a cell, anything like that. Uh, if that had been anybody we know, it would have been the opposite. Oh, yeah. So you just see that good old boy system still at, at work down in the low country? Yeah. So um, July 29th, 2019, the judge... Uh, modified his bond to allow him to travel anywhere within the state of South Carolina, saying that he, for him to go to school, for him to live, anything like that. Um, so basically, he just keeps to get to go on with his life like he was doing before. Essentially. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so Fitz News in South Carolina found out that two of the responding officers had ties to the family's law firm. I think you're going to be hard pressed to find anybody in, in public service down there who's not tied to this family in some way or another. Oh, yeah. It's almost you think, in, why wasn't it moved to a different jurisdiction, maybe Charleston or, or another county where, you know, dad's not one of the, the prosecutors? Oh, yeah. I don't know. I mean. Yeah. That's crazy. So it should be noted that on in May of 2017, Paul was cited for being in possession of beer or wine by a minor by the DNR. Um, the charges were dismissed on July 5th, 2018, after he completed an alcohol diversion program and wasn't brought up at his bond hearing. Yeah, to me, I, see, this is where I don't understand the law sometimes, where you can't bring up something in the past that would point to the fact that this isn't the first time this kid's operated a boat while intoxicated. Yeah. I mean, it's not like he ran into the bridge and everybody was okay. Somebody died. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so um, what, what he was uh, facing before his death was uh, 
up to 15 years in prison for the boating under the influence with great bodily injury and 25 years for the fatality. And, um, you know, they were talking about this oyster rose. There were adults at this oyster rose who tried to not let them boat back. They made it sound like it was because of the weather and not the fact that everybody was sloppy drunk. But, I mean... Come on, there's all they may have just been as drunk as these kids. That's kind of how it goes at these oyster roasts. But yeah. you think about the negligence. Now they were supposedly drinking alcohol from the boat that they had brought. Um, but it seems like some adult there should have said, "Hey, let me see your boat keys." Yeah, you're not getting them back. Oh yeah. They they you know somebody in the group uh, offered to call an Uber, and nobody wanted to do it. Yeah, I mean in the day we live in now, come on. There's too much uh, driving under influence uh, information out there. Yeah. Like. So we're going to jump to the 911 call. Um, the caller says that they're in Archer's Creek near Paris Island. As you guys know, Paris Island is the Marine Recruiting Depot, I guess you call it. Uh, it's yeah, where basic training. All Marines go through Paris Island, I believe. Yeah. Yep. Uh, he says there's been a boat crash. Somebody's missing. And you can hear just this kind of chaos in the background. Wow. So 911 dispatch is relaying info to officers on scene, and she said Mallory was sitting on her boyfriend's lap at the time of the high-speed crash. The reason, according to Anthony, that she was sitting in his lap is that the boat was going so fast that they were starting to get scared. And so they sat in the floor, and she was in his lap. When they hit, she flew out, and they didn't find her. Wow. Um, So... Like we said earlier, there was a lot of confusion with this dispatcher about where they actually were, and she sent rescue to the wrong spot. I mean, there was some precious moments there. Who knows? I mean, yeah. maybe Mallory could have been found unconscious and, yeah. and been saved. Who knows? But but you think about it. I mean, you're on the water, so and and those rivers have uh, the, the currents are strong. Yeah, on those back waterways, there I've been on them, and uh, th- there's a strong current. Unfortunately, this poor girl just was a victim and I, I, I don't know that anything could have been done well think about it you've got intoxicated people right it's right. dark like how i could understand where that could be uh confused a little bit a little bit confusion on what bridge or whatever yeah yeah but there's only one going to paris island so i don't know i mean yeah i'm sure that the, the person talking if you listen to the 911 call he seems very dazed so it, it may not be this dispatcher's fault. I mean, I was kind of confused listening to it, too. Yeah. So the boat had a large split in the hull all the way to the back, according to Beaufort Water Search and Rescue. Yeah, they said there was like a six-foot gash. And it, it um, somebody from the DNR, or for Bu- Beaufort Water Search and Rescue, said the boat came apart at the seam, it looked like, from the nose to the back of the boat. Yeah, boat wrecks are horrible. They are terrible. And we have a lot of them here because we have a lot of lakes here in the upstate. We have Lake Hartwell and my favorite, Lake Joe Cassie. And a lot of times what you see is somebody who's been drinking, jumps in the water to swim, and they never surface. This time of year, I mean, maybe one day every weekend, we get some kind of an alert of an accident on the water. Oh, yeah. And, And the thing is, a lot of people drink on the water. Yep. I mean, I've rarely passed boats where I don't see beer cans or beer bottles in the cup holders. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you just hope that whoever's driving isn't. Uh, yeah. I drinking. mean, I would never let somebody who had been drinking drive me. I don't no. care if you're driving me in a big wheel. I ain't getting on. Nope. So we're going to jump to the wrongful death suit, and we are nearly done with with this story for now. Um. So it says. Paul bought alcohol with his brother's ID at a Parker's gas station. Um, And we said it's like a convenience store. Um, Paul's brother and father were sued by Mallory's mother for the sale of alcohol and the use of the brother's ID. Paul's response to the lawsuit was Mallory, with knowledge of the risk, voluntarily exposed herself to and assumed the risk of injury. Yeah, so they did the, the most common thing you do is you dirty up the victim and say she knew he was drinking and... She got in that boat. She was also drinking. I mean, I don't know of many people who are grossly intoxicated who can make really sound decisions. Yeah. Um, It sounds like there was just chaos on the boat. Yeah. By the end of this trip, because you have people wanting to still drink and you have people who say, I'm an adult and I have a job and I need to get home. You know, maybe my family is not, you know, this hundred year old dynasty in the low country. I have to work tomorrow. Exactly. So, um, 
I lost where I was. So some of the other passengers say that Mallory was scared to be in the boat, and and they tried to convince Paul to let Anthony ride the boat, but um, he wouldn't let him. And then in the civil suit, it says that Paul's father, who owns the boat, failed to supervise his son when he knew or should have known his son was illegally using a license to buy and consume alcohol. And given the fact that they drank the alcohol on his father's property um, and the fact that he allowed them to is why he's named in this suit as well. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Um, they left the residence and boarded the boat to the oyster roast. Um, the couple who owned that property also allowed the miners to consume alcohol and operate the boat while intoxicated. Yeah, and I think maybe they were named initially in this wrongful death suit, but they were two of the people that uh, had been removed from that suit. One of the boaters, uh, one of the, the people that was in the boat, her parents were at this oyster roast, but she said they didn't know she was traveling to and from by boat. Um, that they maybe, I guess, wouldn't have let her or, or whatever. But so you see, there were plenty of adults there, and nobody was monitoring these kids. Yeah, it's crazy. It is crazy. Yep. So from there, two of the miners were served alcohol at Luther's Rare and Well Done. Um, the boat crash happened after leaving there. Um, Beaufort to Paris Island is about 10 miles. It's about 10 miles on the waterway. Um, so there was a witness inside the Parker's convenience store who just at a glance noticed that Paul looked too young to be buying alcohol. And this witness said that the cashier kind of glanced over the ID, which belonged to his older brother, Buster. And, um, somebody had said that Buster is taller and he's pudgy to where Paul really wasn't. And that, um, I mean, I think the thing that they're trying to get across in this wrongful death suit is if that convenience store clerk hadn't sold them the alcohol, maybe they would not have been as intoxicated. You know, it's... It sounds like they were... They had all the opportunities in the world. To, they would have gotten the alcohol yeah. anyway, I'm sure. Yeah. Even if Buster had to go buy it himself. Yep. So... um the South Carolina Attorney General's office says that even though Paul is dead, they're still investigating the accident. I kind of wonder if it's the accident itself or maybe what happened afterwards. Yeah. Um, because we see there were some things. I mean, when they just stop sobriety tests or things like that because daddy and grandpa show up and say they're lawyers. Um, I don't think that a cop, if I get pulled over and they're doing a sobriety test, if my dad pulls up, I don't think the cop's gonna <laughs> going to say, oh, yeah, we'll stop. Uh, no. Right. No. Um, so, uh, Parker's is a large convenience store chain in the low country. Um, and this, uh, this is Anthony Cook, uh, his testimony from the civil suit, what I could find of it, it, it was not in full. Um, but th- this is some of the things that he stated in the civil suit. So he confirmed Paul was driving. Um, he said up until the crash, everyone was arguing. Uh, they drifted in circles many times and were idle for a long time. Um, Another passenger, Molly, was hollering she had to get home for work the next morning and was asking Paul to hurry and get them uh, home. Right. And so we know at this point the argument is that Connor and Paul wanted to go do more shots and everybody else wanted to um, wanted to go home. So he said Paul got mad because the other passengers were trying to tell him to let Anthony drive. And Paul said, nobody knew the effing river like him and nobody is driving the effing boat, but him. Um, so, and and here's another thing. Anthony testified that Connor held the steering wheel at times because Paul would get up and walk in the boat while it was still moving. Wow. That's crazy. Um, he said Paul was making a fool of himself. Um, and he acted like he was on drugs. Um, we talked about, uh, him taking his clothes off or whatever. Uh, he was taken to the hospital in his boxers where he was photographed. So at one point, Paul is arguing with his girlfriend, Morgan, who's also on the boat. He got up, stepped away from the wheel, walked back to where his girlfriend was, and he slapped her, pushed her and spit on her. And at one point, Mallory says something to Paul about how he was treating his girlfriend, Morgan, And he kind of pointed his finger at her and told her to shut up. And so Anthony made very clear, you need to back off. Don't bother her. This was a train wreck from the beginning. Oh, gosh, yeah. And I I, I mean, it just seems like this brat. I mean, I I hate to say it because he's dead, but I mean, you have people saying, hey, man, let us drive. You're way too drunk. You've got him not taking people back when they want to go back. 
just mm. yeah so he said someone hit the throttle um so hard that he fell down uh that the boat's nose was in the air yeah so um he said when the boat hit the pylon that anthony and mallory both were ejected from the boat and so anthony said that when he hit the water it almost felt like he you know how you feel when you wake up just that very kind of heavy head confused feeling i guess oh yeah I would say probably just from his head hitting the water. I mean, water's like concrete when you're going fast. And so he said there was a strong current, so he kind of swam with it to a pylon. And then when he realized the group was at the next pylon, he swam over to them. Wow. I mean, there is like tide coming in and out and yeah. stuff like that. So I could see where... Oh, yeah. Um, but that's like getting water thrown in your face. It is. And I mean, those of us that kind of grew up on the coast... We know you swim with the current. You don't swim against it. So if you get caught in a riptide, the one thing people do is try to swim really, really fast to to beat it. And all you do is exhaust yourself. So mainly when you're in a rip current, we were taught as kids, if it gets you, you just kind of relax on your back and let it take you because it will eventually take you to shore. Yep. So he said that the current was was very hard to swim against. And he said it took him 20 minutes or so to get over to where they were. Yeah. And so when he got there... He wanted to know where Mallory was, and then that's when they realized she's missing. She's not there. Yeah. And that's another thing. I mean, obviously, there wasn't life jackets, or they didn't have them on. Yeah. Um, so, I'm a, I'm a fruitcake about wearing life jackets in a I am, too. It freaks I, me out. I'm a, well, I mean, I'm probably not as good of a swimmer as I used to be just because I'm in my 40s, but, I mean, I've always been a good swimmer. I always wear life jackets on a boat. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, Miley Altman, um, this is Connor's girlfriend, the one who they thought initially could have been driving the boat. She essentially testified the same thing that he did. And so that's kind of where this ends. Now, how this ties in, if at all, to these this double homicide, I don't think so. I just, I don't know. My gut's telling me right now there's something else going on. But it is very important when you're talking about this double homicide to include this boat wreck because there's such a history there with this family. Yeah. And yeah. so we're going to keep an eye on this one. I'm very interested. It's close enough to us to where if, if they arrest somebody and this goes to trial, we could go to it, stay down at the beach house and just, you know, get in our car and go to go to court every day. Uh, but it's a big case just across the country because there's something fascinating about these dynasty well-to-do families that are very well connected. Oh, yeah. And there is in South Carolina. It's a, you know, low country. You always kind of think they're still doing the debutante stuff, the high society these you know i don't know what they call them but they have these balls where the women dress in white almost looking like wedding dresses and they have escorts it's just a high society thing. oh yeah yeah and um so anyways that's what we're watching and we're gonna end this here we're gonna have a sweet tea session coming up for you right after this so uh we will keep an eye on this if anything happens we will tweet it out facebook it maybe hop on for a sweet tea session yep sounds good all right have a good afternoon Good after well, I don't know, like goodbye, I guess. Yeah, no, it's it's two thirty. It is, ain't it? <laughs>